body went to like jello and to think about rolling over in bed or something seemed like a hard thing to do. Uh, or to go to the bathroom. I'd tell Davy and I'm going to go to the bathroom and she'd come back 30 minutes later and say, I thought you said you were going to the bathroom. I said, I'm working on it. <laughs> Just to get up and move. And, and then when it moved into the whole pneumonia thing without being able to breathe, then it got even more scary because I would go into a coughing fit and then that led into dry heaves and then you're trying to breathe and you can't get any air and uh, it's, it's pretty spooky. And honestly, I thought, that's it, I'm, I'm going to die. The days right before Christmas especially. So I pulled the family together and told them everything, all the passwords to the computers, and everything I thought they might need to know as far as how to function a little bit without me, and, and uh, that was it. And, and it, was, it, was, it was difficult. I remember going in, I remember long before even anybody in the family got COVID, that I had prayed to the God and said, Lord, if COVID's going to strike our family, then put the worst of the burden on me. And of course I prayed that. And I think every man that is a husband and a father understands that. But um, part of it had to do with Benjamin. I certainly didn't want Benjamin, who has asthma, to be overwhelmed with COVID. And part of it had to do with Mariah. I didn't want my only daughter to suffer. And part of it had to do with Shab. I just didn't want my Shab, my sincere Shab that is so loving and caring to be the one to suffer the most. And it had to do with Tobin. I didn't want Tobin, my great uh, lover of animals and lover of work and, and uh, uh, in inspiration. I mean, he's just got a heart at such a young age for the Lord and didn't want him to suffer. And David, why would I want him to suffer? You know, he's our talent, our musical talent. He's the one full of joy and laughter in the family and always able to, to take a hard situation and actually make people laugh in the midst of it. And Josiah, you know, he is the leader in the family of the kids and pressing through his career and trying to find himself in the Lord and such an inspiration and in worship. Why would I want Josiah to suffer? And Davine, you know, she's the strength of our family. And if you took her down, then all of us would be down. And so there was no way I wanted her to suffer. And so in a way, God answered my prayer and let me suffer and uh, to be the one. Suffering is interesting. We often question about why, you know, why God's timing, why would he allow this to happen? Lots of questions happen and we grow a lot during suffering because we're put in such a humble position that we have to speak with God in kind of plain terms. We kind of get past the these and the thous all of a sudden, and we have a reality check, and we begin to speak with our Father in ways that maybe we wouldn't naturally speak with Him. And so suffering usually turns out to be a very good thing, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I want to pray first. Father, thank you for allowing me to stand here this morning. Father, thank you for your grace and your power. Thank you, Father, that you wrote the story long ago, and that even though we go through difficult times, we see strange things in our policies, in our nation, in our neighborhoods, and even suffering in our family. We, we know, God, that you wrote the end of the story. Father, we know that you are the victor. We know that the truth will prevail. We know that the saved will go to heaven. And we know that you are full of grace and truth and the power of healing. We know that nothing inhibits you. We know that you are not tired. Lord, we know that you have not become weak or lessened in strength during these times. We know that you are sovereign and all-powerful. And we pray, God, that you would move in our hearts to follow you in a richer, deeper way. Father, we pray that we would be instruments in this day, in this hour, when men are suffering and they're confused and they're full of fear, I pray, God, that you would equip us so that we would not be full of fear, but that we would be full of your spirit, of power, of grace. Yeah. That spirit that sets, men free, sets people free, that, that spirit that breaks the chains of bondage to sin, to doubt, to fear, to hate, to bitterness, to so many things. Lord, you are the answer, and I pray that you would help us to tap into that river of living water. And I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I, I kind of want to talk about Peter's denial, but my head is so full of so many different things 
that I've been seeing in the Word that I'm not sure where we'll go or how much we'll get through. But I want to start uh, with at least trying to talk a little about Peter's denial. And, and I am doing this because the story of Peter denying Christ is a story of a person who was wrestling with trying to understand why is Jesus doing it this way? Why are things coming down the pipe like this? Why is this the method that God is choosing for this hour? And so a lot of his denial wasn't just because he wanted to deny Jesus or some inerrant evil in him or some uh, feeling within him that he wanted to uh, push back against Jesus. It, it had a lot to do with faith. It had a lot to do with confusion. It had a lot of, uh, to do with the political setting of his time and looking at the situation and looking at the way that Jesus was leading and thinking, you're not leading right. You're not doing it the right way. So we're going to look first at Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 26. It was coming very close to Jesus' time to be offered up and to suffer. One more commercial on suffering. What greater love can you someone can you give to someone than to suffer for them? You take their suffering. I mean, we feel it when people do that for us. I can't even tell you how many people came to our home during this period and left food on the doorstep or money. I mean, it was crazy the amount of blessings that came from many of you and many, many other people throughout the valley. People that we're not even in close contact with. We're coming and, and, and generously blessing our family. They were allowing themselves to suffer for us. They were taking from their income and their time, their efforts, to try to give us some comfort. And the overwhelming love of the valley just blew my heart away. I, I wept sometimes when people pulled up the driveway and dropped stuff off. Couldn't, it. couldn't taste the food, but I was I was blessed. <laughs> no, I my taste and smell never went away, uh, which was interesting. One of the weird quirks as we all go through the COVID battle, some of you that get to go through it, um, was that I would eat, and then after I get done eating, the aftertaste of food would taste like metal, uh -huh. and it was nasty, like I was sucking on an aluminum can or something. And so you try to get that aftertaste out of your mouth. And then I had a period where I could taste every grain of salt. All of a sudden, every food tasted salty. And so even for a normally salted food uh, that the family would be enjoying, I'd be like, man, did someone like dump the salt shaker in this thing or what? This is, this is salty. And so poor Davine had to learn how to cook for a little bit for me without salt at all because I could taste salt like it was in the air. <coughs> strange. Very strange. COVID is... Very strange uh, manipulated uh, disease or sickness or virus or whatever we're calling. And uh, I hope most of you never get to go through it. As I look at the crowd here, I see that half of you already have. <laughs> so. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He began to speak plainly to them. This wasn't parable time anymore. He just told them plainly, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And uh, this didn't settle well. I mean, this was a revolution. Jesus was the leader of what was called the Messianic Movement. He was the coming king. He's, he's supposed to be the person to set them free from the oppression of Rome and, and, and put the Jewish colonies back in order and, and help the people of, of Judaism to stand free again in their own country. And so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him and say, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. A couple things come to mind when I when I read this verse. One is, 
I kind of go through this quandary of, was it that Jesus was so approachable that Peter felt like he could take the Messiah aside and rebuke him? Or was Peter just that proud and arrogant and bold that he felt like he could take the Messiah aside and rebuke him? Or was it some combination of both? And he says, never. You know, some translations say, God forbid, or this can't happen to you. It's an interesting word in the Greek. It literally kind of means unthinkable. If we research the word enough and see how it was used in the old days of the Old Testament, it's a word that means this would never cross God's mind. Hmm. This, this is something that God would never do. So, so the New Testament translators that, that put God forbid are, are trying to say that, that what you just said, Jesus, is so dark and so evil. You've got to understand, that would never be God's plan. It would never be God's plan to let you suffer and die. And Jesus' response is just as strong. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. It's kind of interesting when we get to a point in our journey with God or journey with Jesus that we actually begin to think that we have the mind of God and that when we see a situation, we make a judgment call. Is this God's will or is it not God's will? Is what, go, what they're going through or what I'm going through God's will? What they're proposing? Is it God's will or is it not God's will? And, and we begin with our wisdom and our understanding, maybe from years of studying the Word or interacting with God, to try to figure that out. Is this the Lord's will? And even Jesus wrestled with this in the garden in his last moments. If this is, if there's any way, God, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. And so this questioning of God's will, but in this case, Peter's not questioning what God's will is. He's determined to think he knows God's will. He's made up his mind. This is not God's will, Jesus. What you're planning to go through, no, that's not the will of God. And Jesus calls him Satan. Wow, you, you would think it's over for you. I would, if God came to me and spoke to me and said, you are safe, I'd be like, man, I'm going to hell. <laughs> this is over for me. There's no mercy for me. There's no future for me. And Satan, you know, anyone, you know, think of what that really means. Satan's not really a name. It's, it's an attribute. The accuser. He's the accuser. So he accuses us all the time before God. He's a great keeper of a record of wrongs. He knows every wrong you may have committed. And he's a great reminder of what those wrongs are. Then Jesus says to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, if you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself. And take up your cross and follow me. You know, what Peter wanted was a successful kingdom. He wanted victory. He wanted Jesus to lead the charge. He wanted to be on the winning side. He wanted to see a change in his political environment. He wanted to see a change in the oppression that they were feeling from Rome. He wanted to see that God would be exalted, that the Torah would be lifted, that the word of God would be lifted, that the people of God would live free in the land that they had been promised to Abraham. Seemed like all good things. And here Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. You have to deny your conclusions. You have to deny the life that you think is supposed to be the way you think it's supposed to be. Somewhere you have to surrender your life to the cross. Somewhere you have to surrender your life to Jesus. Some point in your life you have to say, God, I don't understand everything, but I trust you enough to let you have it. And at this point, there hadn't been the cross that we understand because Jesus hadn't been crucified, but the Romans were using the cross as the execution chair for all criminals of the dead. So the outskirts of the town were already lined with crosses of criminals. So Jesus was speaking plainly. 
that if you're going to follow me, you may die by the hands of your country. Hmm. It was a strange call. It was a call to death. And he makes it clear. He says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. You know, it's the natural gravity of man to want to save life. If you're drowning, you, you, you struggle to get air and you try to climb to the top. If you're suffering or you're burning, if your hand touches an open flame, your, your body instinctively pulls it back and jerks it back. We instinctively want to live. We want to be free. And Jesus is saying, if you want to save your life, you are going to lose it. Hmm. What does he mean? But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Now he brings the soul into the picture. It's not just about life here on earth. It's about eternity. And this life on earth sometimes can be really good for us. Sometimes we make enough money that it's comfortable. Sometimes we feel healthy enough that it's pleasant. Sometimes we have great relationships that make us laugh, that are fun, and we're just having a great time, and, and earth is fun, and we're having a blast. And here's Jesus saying, I need you to not be earth-focused. Yeah. That if you're earth-focused, you will not make it to heaven. Hmm. You have to be heaven-focused. Right. You have to be willing to lay down your earth-focus to make it to heaven. If you want to follow me, he says, this is the way. You have to deny yourself. Are you saying you never can have fun? No, I'm not saying you can never have fun. Fun is something God created. The things that you appreciate about earth, its beauty, its pleasure, its joy, come from the Father. They come from Him. They're a reflection. They're a shadow of the great glorious things that will happen in heaven. But don't let those things become your idol. Don't let those things become what drives you. Don't let those things become what you fight and claw for to the point that you put God on the shelf. Hmm. That you put your relationship with Jesus on a different rung of the ladder. He needs to be at the top. You have to seek Him, His kingdom, and His righteousness first because if He's not first, then the world's first for you. And we all know that the world can be fun, and we all know the world can hurt us, but our treasure lies in heaven. Peter had expectations of Jesus, and Jesus wasn't meeting them. You know, I have a side kicker here. If Peter had expectations of Jesus and his leadership, and Jesus did not meet Peter's expectations, I can guarantee you that I will not meet your expectations. Hmm. Wow. As a person that God has allowed to be a shepherd of a flock, I will disappoint you. Hmm. And I will not meet your expectations. If Jesus could not meet the expectations of Peter, hmm. I cannot meet your expectations. Because I'm not Jesus. And even if I were Jesus, the second you step into the flesh and put your terrestrial eyes back on, Jesus will disappoint you. And unfortunately for me, I'm not even close enough to Jesus to not step in the flesh. So I too get to step in the flesh and have legitimate reasons that you would be disappointed by me. It's just a sad truth about our expectations in life. And so Peter's wrestling with all this, and, 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 and we see where it stemmed and where it began. It began because Jesus was not meeting Peter's expectations. This made Peter vulnerable to disowning Jesus. This was the beginning of, of a seed in his heart of disappointment. It was where Satan saw a crack, and we're going to see this in the next passage, that Satan saw a crack and wants to sift him like wheat. You'll see this. And, and, and this is what happens, is we make expectations in our life. And, and when those expectations are not met, then we begin to tear down 
who we expected them from. I think of it in marriage. It's so interesting in marriage how many expectations come to the play. And, and the world is funny because the world tries to defeat this by living together. The world says, live together, have sex together, join your finances, live in the same apartment, try out the shoes first, see if they're comfortable, and once you've worn them for a year or so, then you'll know if marriage is right for you. Because once you've worn it and everything and done everything right, you can put the shoes on, you'll know, and you, you'll feel comfortable. you you got a great sex life together. you got a great humor together. You're working together. The bills are flowing together. The finances are good. You guys are entertained by one another. Hey, maybe it's time for us to get married. And then you get married, and it seems like it's not working. And you're like, what in the world? We did everything together. Why can't we get along now? Expectations. <laughs> Each of you go into marriage with expectations. And when your expectations are not met, then the marriage begins to have friction and discomfort. And why? And it seems like you've changed and you're not the same person. And all this happens. Guess what? The world tells us, according to the U.S. Census, that those who live together and then marry are 70% likely to divorce. Wow. You like that? How do you like that soup? It's not very good. Because hmm. what makes a successful marriage is not trying on the shoes first. Yeah. Expectations. What makes a successful marriage? Boy, that's a whole nother lesson. And I'll defer to Scott. <laughs> Scott, it's his specialty. But I will plant the seeds of this. God is a big help. Yeah. And learning one another's expectations before you marry is extremely helpful. Well, how do you do that? Well, you begin to ask one another, what does marriage look like? What does marriage look like to you? What is it? Describe to me a day in marriage. There are so many different methods, so many great books about love and marriage. I remember with Davine and I, I don't know if it was a requirement in marriage or if we just came to this decision. But she was set on us reading certain books before we got married. Mm. And we read, and she, I think she read three books to my one. But, <laughs> and it shows. She's a good one. But um, they were so helpful to peer into these books because they help you ask the questions. What the world's saying is, Did you try it out. But what the spiritual side says is ask the questions, dig deep, get advice. With many advisors, there's success. Mm. Luke chapter 22 and verse 28 to 34. Thank you for listening along here, folks. I love you guys, and I'm so happy to be here with you in person. It is great to look out and see real people. I am so encouraged, and I know that I get out of breath a little bit. That's left over from the pneumonia. Paige tells me that might be around for months, but I'm trying to get past that. <laughs> Several have come to me and said that that might be lingering for a long time. I'm praying for the super natural healing and interference of God. He just lets me just kind of click and then the breathing is right back to normal. But up until that point, I'm going to push, push, push. Just like the sermon we heard ended with Josiah where he said, pray until something happens. Yeah. And uh, that was really rich and simple and that's what we need to do. Pray until something happens. So, here in Luke chapter 22 and verse 28, and I'm using the same Bible Dean was trying to find the verse in it, and now I found it. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom. Just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Simon replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you even know me. 
So there's a few things in the passage. First, God, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says to them, I confer on you a kingdom. This is the Great Commission, and I, this is a commercial. But the, the Great Commission is that famous verse in Matthew, the last passage is there, and it says in Matthew chapter 28, that we are supposed to go unto all the world and preach the gospel. We're supposed to preach this message, this saving message that Tobin was talking about at communion. And we've got to get it out there because there's people to be saved. There's people to be rescued. And here's Jesus in the last day of his life, or the last days, I should say, very few moments left. And he says, I am conferring on you a kingdom. A lot of us, when we hear kingdom, we think of heaven. And a lot of times the Bible speaks of the kingdom of heaven. But there is so much more to be understood by the terminology kingdom. And one term that we should understand is that the kingdom, it, at one point the, the Pharisees, the religious, are asking Jesus, well, show us the kingdom, or, or where is the kingdom? And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is within you. There's an aspect of God's kingdom that is living and active right now today, that you can become a member of God's kingdom today. It doesn't mean you have to die to get to God's kingdom. Being part of God's kingdom is being part of God's body. Being part of God's uh, reign. Being part of God's church. And when you are part of his church, you enter into his kingdom. You're at the preliminary onset of that kingdom. And so here he's conferring the kingdom on them. He's telling, he's telling them, I'm, I'm giving you the authority. I'm giving you the power. I'm going to be gone soon. He's told them, I'm going to suffer and die. I'm not going to be around. But I am equipping you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you of my spirit. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are going to have the reins of the kingdom. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And I'm going to equip you with the power of my spirit in you to confer that kingdom on more people. And to set more people free. And to see the deliverance of more people. And so there's a taste of that. And he begins to introduce that to them. And he's talked about it in other places. But then he turns to, to Peter, our guy. And he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. You know, there's a very curious thing about, I don't know how your translations hold up, but when I read the NIV, it, it seems very personal to, to Peter. But the fact is, it says, Satan has asked to sift you all. Satan has asked to sift all of you as we. It's plural. And so what does that mean? Well, in the old Bible days, if you can picture with me a pitchfork, and you find a stone area, usually high on a hill, something flat, and you'd get your wheat up there, or your grain, and you'd get your pitchfork and you'd throw it up in the air, or first, actually, you would trample it. They'd get boards with rocks on the bottom, and they'd trample the sweet. They'd thresh it, break it up. They're trying to separate the grain from the chaff. And then you'd get your pitchfork, and you'd scoop it up, and you'd toss it up in the air, and the wind blows the chaff away, because the chaff has no grain in it, it has no fruit in it, it has no weight to it, it's lighthearted, it's empty. The chaff is just the stalk. The chaff may look like the weed even, or look like the grain, but it doesn't have the same weight to it. It has no impact. And so the littlest breeze will begin to blow the chaff away, but the wheat will remain. And so what Satan is saying to Jesus is that I want to take your group of disciples, and I want to find out which ones of them are wheat, and which ones are chaff. It's time for a testing. It's time to really see what they're made of. Lord Jesus, if I fresh them a little bit and toss them up in the air, we'll see who really stands with you and who's really part of your flock, Jesus. And so Jesus submits to the group and says that Satan has desired to sift them like wheat. And he pinpoints Simon. But I pray for you, Simon. Because... What that means is by all indications, Simon, it doesn't look like you're going to make it. Simon, it doesn't appear that you are the wheat. 
by all appeals of your testimony and the things we've seen you do and the way that you've resisted Jesus, it seems as if you're not going to stand at the slightest breeze or on the threshing floor. But Jesus says, I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen the brothers. Mm. So Jesus says, after this threshing, you're going to fall. You're actually going to fall. Because he says, I pray for you. And when you turn back, to turn back, you had to turn away. And he tells Peter plainly that after this is over, I've chosen you to strengthen your brothers. He gives him the place of, of, of uh, leadership. He gives him the place that he gets to be the forefront. We know as people that have been in church for a while that Peter is the one that delivers that first sermon on Pentecost. Yeah. He gives him the place to stand up and preach the truth of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The freedom that comes from the gospel. And to declare to the people if they repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit will fill them and their sins will be washed away. Hmm. He gives them that honor. Even though he's here in this picture going to be sifted by Satan. You know, I won't go there. I'm going to skip it. Another sermon's coming. <laughs> so we'll talk about Peter's denial. So it's the last moments, and Peter's still in confusion. Even with all these hints, he still doesn't have it. He still has to fall to, to get to that humble position where he's receptive to see and to hear again. And so Peter denies Christ. And it happens in this way. Jesus is praying. The soldiers come. Judas is sifted like wheat. Mm. Judas falls out of it. The, the category of followers. Satan successfully entices him away. Not because, well, it could have been Judas's expectations that Jesus would do something different, but it was also Judas's greed. His, his own selfish greed came to play, pulled him away. Instant regret because the money didn't fulfill his need. What he wanted to get from money the pleasure he wanted from money, the joy he wanted from money, the deliverance he wanted from money, whatever it was he sold Jesus out for, when he got the money it wasn't enough, the best he could do was throw the money back on the temple floor and commit suicide. Yeah. We think money will be the answer to our needs. It certainly wasn't the answer for Judas. He was sifted like wheat. So here's Peter in the garden, and they come to get Jesus and Peter's for war. I will go to prison with you, Lord. I will die with you, Lord. And they come with their swords and their stuff. And Peter's got a sword. And they get close enough. And he goes and he, they're trying to get Jesus. And so he draws his sword and he goes to whack off Malchus's head. And, and Malchus, I guess, docks, ducks. And, and the sword knocks one ear off. And, and Jesus says, stop. Let's take the way it's going to go down. He rebukes Peter. Here's Peter being arrested. I mean, here's Jesus being arrested. Here's, here's, here's the battle beginning. And, and, and Peter's at the forefront. I'll lead the charge, Lord. I'll die for you. And he gets rebuked. He says, no. He stoops down and puts the guy's ear back on. Performs his last miracle. It's amazing. And Peter's confused. You just put the ear back on the guy that I try to whack his hand off. <laughs> Whose side are you on, Jesus? What's your plan here, Jesus? I don't get it. And he runs away. But he runs at a distance. One of the other disciples, who I imagine is John. Maybe John Mark. Maybe the other John. And he's kind of got the insider. And so they make their way into the places where Jesus was taken. And so Peter is out there, very close to Jesus. Kind of almost trying to overhear the accusations and and all the things going on with him. He's trying to stay close. He, he's in confusion. He's trying to figure out whose side is Jesus on and whose side am I on and, and, and how's this work? And he's warming his hands at the fireside near where the servants of Herod and the, and, and, and the, the Roman type uh, servants are and he's hiding out. 
John 18, 17, one of the women, a handmaiden, says to Peter, You're not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. And Peter said, I am not. You're not one of his disciples, are you? And then a, he flat out denies it, but then it comes at him again. John 18, 26, one of the high priest servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? If there's anybody that would have recognized him, it would have been a relative of the guy who, you know, whoa, Peter just whacked off my, my relative's ear. Uh, he knew it was Peter, and he says, didn't I see you in the garden? And we all grow with Jesus. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. I've kind of glued together some of the statements from the different Gospels and the way they record it. In Luke 22, 59, it says, This man was with him, for he's a Galilean. Here's the big bummer of it all, is that everybody from Galilee spoke with an accent. Hmm. And Jesus drew all his disciples from Galilee. And Jesus himself grew up in Nazareth. And so they're like, your accent gives you away, dude. We know who you are. Stop denying it. And then Peter began to call down curses on himself. And he swore to them, I don't know a man. Then he went away and wept bitterly. One passage in there, I believe it's Luke, says, at that third time, the Lord was able to make eye contact with him. And to look at him. And then the rooster crowed. Because Jesus prophesied that at a certain hour, you will have already denied me three times. In 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13, is a powerful verse. It says, here's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Wow. The word for disown there is the exact same word used in the text for what Peter did. Peter disowned Jesus. Peter disassociated himself with Jesus. Peter denied that he had interaction with Jesus. Peter didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Peter all of a sudden said, you know, the vision that Peter uh, had for the kingdom was very different than the vision that Jesus had for the kingdom. Therefore, I don't want to be associated to it. Sometimes in our life, we're seeing what God's plans are. and We're so confused that we think, this can't be God's plan. This voice I'm hearing cannot be the voice of God. Never, Lord! Not you, God forbid! Unthinkable! This would not cross the mind of God. We've got our minds so made up and we're so filled with our own self-pride and self-righteousness that we think we have God figured out. And we miss the way. And we disassociate ourselves. From what God's real plan is. In John chapter 21, verse 15, Jesus raises from the dead. And it's an amazing passage. Jesus raised from the dead, but now he's got to kind of fix everybody. Yeah. All his disciples scattered. They still were kind of in confusion about what just happened. And they began to see him. And he appears to them. And this is the third time that he decides to appear to them. He's not going to keep appearing to them. There's going to come a point when he's going to go up into heaven. And nobody's going to see him again according to the scriptures. Until he returns in the clouds with the angels. Hmm. That's why I'm the first one to throw away your books that say you've seen and met Jesus face to face. Hmm. It doesn't line up with the scriptures. Are you going to follow the scriptures? Or are you going to follow your popular whims? Yeah. Are you going to follow the religious cults of our day? Are you going to be enticed away like Israel was and every other person we read about in the book? Or are you going to stick to the Word of God? Hmm. At what place is the Word of God going to be in your life? Is it going to be high or low? 
You're going to let your demonic experiences dictate what is truth. Wow. Your ideals and your expectations. Or are you going to stick to the word? Because if we're going to be unified and if we're going to do what God wants us to do, we're going to have to put this first. Yeah. Jesus doesn't show up to preach the gospel today. That's your job. Hmm. The Bible makes it very clear that in the old times, he spoke in certain ways. But in these last days, this is the age of the Holy Spirit. If you want to know who gets exalted in this age, it's the Holy Spirit in you. And you might say, well, Jesus is the Holy Spirit of one. Amen. I'm not going to argue all that stuff. You can have it that way. I had one guy come to me and tell me about how Jesus appeared to him and preached the gospel to him. He's like, you know, it just doesn't line up. Hmm. It contradicts, as a matter of fact, so many scriptures. What are you going to take? I choose to take the word. I've had a lot of weird experiences. I had weird visions. Boy, especially during the COVID thing. I was like, I can't take that vitamin anymore. What do they call that? The one that's supposed to help you sleep? Melatonin. Melatonin. I was having some crazy dreams. Man, I was dreaming. And they didn't even make sense. It was like a puzzle all put out of shape. They're like, Davian's like, what was the dream? I'm like, I can't even explain it. It's off this world. I don't want any more melatonin. <laughs> You're dying. You need it. I, no. <laughs> Careful what you eat. Spiritually. There's a lot out there right now. And the Bible prophesied that it would be the same. It said, in the last days, counterfeit miracles will come and deceive many. Hmm. They're deceived. Why? Because it says they do not have a love for the truth. Hmm. If we're going to be a unified body, we can unify around this. We can't unify about your extraterrestrial prophecies or experiences. We can. We can unify around this. Yeah. So he's got some healing to do, Peter. And when they finished eating, verse 15 of chapter 21, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly love me? Do you love me? This is the bottom line. Do you love Jesus? He's the one that's going to rescue you. He's the one that's going to set you free. He's the one that's going to lead and guide you into all truth. Hold on to that more than anything else. Do you love me more than these, more than what? He signs fishing again. Do you love me more than your job, Peter? Do you love me more than the culture you've returned to? We're back in Galilee. We're not in Jerusalem anymore. Do you love me more than your family that you've grouped yourself back into? This lake that you're sailing on. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than this world? Hmm. All the enticements and the pleasures that this world has to offer. Do you love me more? And he asks it with the Greek word of agape. And Peter replies, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I phileo you. It's a different Greek word. And a lot of times they're synonyms. They mean the same thing. You go, oh, here comes the Greek Tuning you out. Philadelphia. You ever heard Philadelphia? <laughs> what does it mean? City of brotherly love. City of brotherly love. It's literally written in there. That's what Philadelphia means. It's a Greek word. You know more Greek than you know. <laughs> Phile. Phileo. Brotherly love. Agape. Used in the most intense forms in the Bible. It's like God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Agape. He doesn't say Philemon. I got this great brotherly love for you. I'm going to give you my son. Some will say that they, there's not a distinction to be made here. I'm going to make a ploy that there is. Hmm. Jesus says, do you agape me? Do you love me? You said you're willing to go to prison for me and to die for me. And when it came down to it, you disowned me three times. Hmm. When your opportunity came to lay down your life, you didn't lay down your life for me. Do you love me? And now you're out here fishing. I died a few days ago and you're out here fishing. Hmm. Do you love me, Peter? 
Lord, you know I got brotherly love for you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Shepherd my little sheep. Lambs is the, is the new ones. Shepherd them. Care for the little ones. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I flail you. Take care of my sheep. Now he steps it up. I, I, I need you to shepherd my little ones, but I also need you to take care of my sheep, the older ones. Remember, Jesus had told him, when you come back, when you're converted, after Satan has sifted you like wheat, I need you to strengthen the brothers. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Jesus condescends. He doesn't use the same Greek word anymore. So it's like this. Jesus says, do you phileo me? And it, it, it's like this. Jesus says, do you agape me? Peter says, I phileo you, Lord. Let me put it in English. Peter, do you love me? I like you, Lord. <laughs> Peter, do you love me? I like you, Lord. Peter, do you like me? No. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you like me? Do you flail me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I flail you. Peter's hurt. Lord, you've seen my love. It didn't stand the test. You know, Lord, that I didn't rise to the call. Lord, you know I denied you three times. Here, you're asking me three times. Lord, my love didn't reach the bar. Lord, I said I would go to prison with you, and I ran. Lord, I said I'd lay my life down with you, and I'd fight with you, but I didn't. And now I'm here fishing. And so my last verse comes from Peter himself. A good 20, maybe even 30 years later, he's giving advice to the church in 1 Peter 1.22. And he says, and there's a lot of different translations on this, but you'll see the magic in a moment. It says, now that you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth, through the Spirit, unto an unhypocritical brotherly love, see that you love one another fervently with a pure heart. Peter uses the two terms of love again. And he calls specifically the Christians higher. Hmm. He says, now that you've attained a point of brotherly love, now that you understand what love is, you begin to taste it in an unfeigned way. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're learning how to love each other like a brother would love a brother. But now, love one another through agape. Take it a little higher. Bring your love to a different position. Through the trial, through the suffering, we're learning to love one another. We're taking care of each other. It's really cool. I think Acorn has grown a lot through this. I think that the suffering and the difficulty of the times are shaping and molding us into a firmer, stronger, more secure structure that can be built on. Mm -hmm. Because we can't build on chaff. We can't build on something the wind's going to blow away. We can't build God's kingdom. He's conferred a kingdom upon, uh, upon us. We can't build that kingdom on scaffolding. And so we've learned a little bit about love through this. But as Peter is doing, and as the Lord was doing with Peter for his healing, I need you to take your love a little higher. To a different level. A level that would suffer. A level that would suffer in a way that's more than you suffering for one another. What do I mean by that? Well... I will suffer for you. But when you ask me to take my son David or Coben or Shah or, and allow them to suffer for you, I'm a little more protective. That's what Jesus did. God said that he so loved the world that he gave his son. 
It's difficult to give yourself to one another. It's more difficult to give your most dear and loved ones to the other. Especially if you assume that by giving them in service to the other person, you're going to abuse them. I am giving my family to Acorn. I remember, and I'm almost done, when I was a missionary to Israel, and we had one son, his name was Josiah, and uh, <laughs> bombs were going off, it was the second intifada, one time Davey and I almost got blown up in a farmer's market because of a suicide bomber. One of the church members, he he was in a vehicle at a stoplight, and there were three cars, one going, he was going to go left, and one was going to go straight, and then one pulled up here to make a right-hand turn, he threw a hand grenade into the vehicle here, and blew up, and all the shrapnel and stuff popped his face as it blew out his windows in his car. The guy in the middle car died. He wasn't part of the congregation. But it was difficult times, and I remember saying to God, I'm willing to die for you, but I don't want to give you my son. And maybe your parents can understand. Maybe you can. I, I think the parents can understand. But I don't want to give you my son. I, I God, I, I adore you. I'm amazed by you. That you gave your son for us. That I, I'm, I'm in, intensely uh, amazed by your love. But I don't want that. He's asking it. Hmm. And guess what? He's not just asking it of me. He's asking that level of love from you. Are you willing to give up your children for Jesus? Because unless you lay their lives down, they will be lost. Yeah. You so much want your children to be saved, but you won't trust them to God. You'd rather let them try on the shoes of the world and hope they'll make the right choice when the time comes. Until you're willing to lay your children down, don't expect God to move on their hearts. Because they've become your idols. They're first. They're above God. Why should God move in your idol? And fortunately, our children are their own person. And maybe by the grace of God, He'll break your level of non commitment and save their souls anyway as he did and does for some families. Sometimes you see some horrid parents put out some amazingly righteous kids. Hmm. But if you want a family to be in Christ, you have to let it down. People say, well, Jeff, how do you get your kids to be like you? It's no magic. I don't beat them in the closet. The Lord taught me to lay them down, to let them die. It's by the grace of God that in the COVID dilemma, I cried back out to him and said, Lord, let me live. Let me be the one to physically die. Let me be the one to suffer. Because the spirit of it's different. Are you willing, Jeff, to let your little son, Benjamin, die? Are you willing to trust me with that? That's the kind of questions I had to ask and answer and say, Lord, yeah. I don't know how to trust you, and I don't know how to understand your plan. I don't know how to understand the way you group things together and you make things move. But I'm supposed to trust you. I don't get it, Lord. But I know that you are good, and you are pleasing, and you are perfect, and I am evil. I am unpleasing, and I am imperfect. Therefore, if that's your plan, Lord, I'm ready to swallow it. What's your plan for life? Father, I thank you for this word. I pray that it has an effect on our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to grow. Lord, I am so excited today about the victory of being here and worshiping you. And, and the worship, Lord, it was amazing. It, it, it just felt so liberating to lift hands and worship you and sing and to be together and 
to smile at one another and to read body language again. And I think, wow, God, we can press through this time. We can press, we can push until we see that something happens. God, let our faith not fall to the ground. Let us not be chaffed. Let us go through the change we need to do. And God, it's so easy. All we have to do is cry out to you. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. I will forgive their sin. Wow, Lord, that's your promise. And I pray that you would equip us with the strength to press in prayer and to surrender ourselves in such a way. I love you, Jesus. In your name.